Hey guys, welcome back for another video. Uh, still traveling here in Amsterdam, so trying to make it so I can crank out about a video a week and stay consistent. A uh, couple quick announcements. First of all, uh, by the time this one's posted, uh, hopefully I'll be around 7,500 subscribers, uh, which if that is the case, then thank you guys a lot. Um, I appreciate all the nice feedback that you've been giving me, all the work that you guys are putting in. If I don't have 7,500, I'll look like kind of an ass by saying this, but whatever, we're close enough. Uh, another quick thing to say is I want to give a shout out to two of my viewers, both of whom have reached out to me uh, in light of their recent uh, new positions, uh, both to Carl for his position as Senior Engineering Manager at Google, and for Roy on his offer at Microsoft. These are guys who have been commenting and interacting with the channel for a while, so to see that payoff really does make my day. Uh, sometimes this channel doesn't get as many views as I would like, but at the end of the day, if that's really all I care about, um, I would just post day in the life videos on TikTok. and you know, fuck systems aside. So anyways, let's get into the content for today. I'm gonna to whip out the iPad and we can get started. All right, so today's video is going to be about serializable snapshot isolation, which is a type of optimistic concurrency control. And so we're gonna talk about what that means. So if you guys watched last video, which I'm hoping you did, it'll help you understand this one a lot better. What we did was we talked about ACID databases, how they tend to achieve full isolation or serializability. And in the past, this has been done with something known as two-phase locking, which is a pessimistic concurrency control, meaning that basically every single transaction that runs, regardless of whether it impacts other transactions, has to grab locks for all of the rows that it reads and writes. And this can be problematic because most of the transactions, like myself, are Sigma mails. They don't deal with other transactions. They do their own thing. And so if I'm just going to run one isolated transaction and you know no one else is even coming near it, I don't have to actually grab those locks. I can just do my own thing. It would speed up the database quite a bit. So basically, optimistic concurrency control is asking the question, well, do we really need locks effectively if what's going to happen is we can just run as normal? And if we do catch that we're about to make a mistake, we can just abort one of those offending transactions and run it. So let's go ahead and start looking at a couple of cases because the general gist of this is we're reading from a snapshot, right? And then once we see some read, modify, update transactions that we don't like, then we're going to have to take a little bit of extra action. So let's look at case one. There are two cases here, and this is where uh, SSI is going to come in. So in the first case, let's imagine we have a database snapshot at T18. So the first thing I should say is a snapshot is just a consistent state of a database at some point in time. Uh, in this case, it would be after transaction 18 was committed. Uh, if you want to know more about snapshot isolation, I already made a video on it probably three or four ago. So I'd recommend watching that if uh, you're a little unsure what I mean here. So let's imagine we have some database table where you know we've got a couple of uh, uh, women and whether they like Jordan or not. Obviously, most of the rows are going to be true, but we'll talk about how that changes throughout the example. So first, we've got Kate Upton. And she obviously likes Jordan, as one does. However, T19 is coming in, and T19 is going to change that field from true to false. But as we know with transactions first, at least for all rights, uh, they're going to be uncommitted, and then eventually they're going to commit. So there's this little bit of time where we can see that a write exists, but it hasn't necessarily gone through yet, meaning we can't read it. Because if we could read uncommitted writes, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, that's a dirty read. So let's go ahead and look at kind of the the time by time things that's going to happen so the first thing is transaction 19 is going to say kate upton no longer likes jordan maybe she saw me busting out some moves on the dance floor i gave her the ick who knows doesn't really matter at time 20 i'm coming along and i see that kate upton likes me obviously i want to send her a dm at the same time though i also see an uncommitted right and i say to myself hmm well, it looks like there's a chance that she might not like me, but it hasn't committed yet. So I'm not sure. I'm still going to go ahead and try and add her to my DMs table. So at, right after that, at the third timestamp, T19 is now going to commit. And so when I eventually go ahead and try to send that DM, I'm going to say to myself, hmm, I remember there was an uncommitted piece of write data. I should probably check whether that's committed or not, just so that I don't look like a fool by sending a girl who doesn't like me a DM. And so what I'll see now when I actually go and check that out is that the committed right has actually gone through, or rather the uncommitted right has actually gone through. And what this means for me is that I need to abort my transaction. It's no longer valid. This uncommitted piece of data that I knew existed but didn't want to act on just yet actually went through. Unfortunately, I've got to restart my transaction, and this time around I'll be sending Karinikov a DM instead. Okay, so let's look at case number two. Case number two is very similar to case number one, and obviously 
to, to be consistent. I've kept the same example with Kate Upton and Karinikov, who both like me. So let's imagine now that at T18, the database looks the same again. Both Kate Upton likes Jordan and Karinikov likes Jordan. And so I'm really feeling spicy today. I'm going to send her three DMs. And all of those DMs are predicated on the fact that Kate Upton still likes me. And those DMs are going to be T19, T20, and T21, right? Uh, you know, if she still likes me, I'm going to say, hey, what's up? How are you doing? Who knows? Let's not get into the specifics of Riz here. Leave that to other content creators. Anyways, so now we have three transactions that have read this value right here, and they haven't yet committed because the, the corresponding write has not yet been sent. So we have to check if the predicate is still valid. So right now, every single time, uh, we're gonna first say, okay, well, we've all read this row. There aren't actually any uncommitted writes on this. So in theory, we're looking good, but we know that the value can still change between my read and my write. So what we have to do here is this piece. The row itself, once it's being read in a transaction, is going to keep track of all those in-progress transactions that have yet to complete. So T19, T20, and T21 are not yet done until they send a corresponding write uh, by virtue of putting a row in the DMs table. So now what's gonna happen at T22 is a new transaction entirely comes along. Kate Upton decides, you know what? I don't like Jordan anymore. Sucks to suck. This is very similar to what happens to me in real life. So as you can see, now Kate Upton has been written and that write has both been uh, you know, uncommitted and also committed. So when I say write, I mean that the write actually went through and it's been committed. So what's useful now is the, the row itself is actually keeping track of all of the transactions that were depending on it. So when this value goes to false, we now need to go right over here and abort all three of these transactions. So as you can see, we're aborting T19, T20, and T21. And we can retry those eventually and just make sure the same conditions apply and see what actually happens. So by virtue of not actually grabbing locks, we're able to achieve isolation, but you know it's not always necessarily the best thing to do. So let's quickly look at a conclusion. SSI is a really great up and coming technology, but it's only really good when most of the transactions aren't getting in the way of each other. Let's say we were to have like, I don't know, a distributed counter or something where every single transaction needs to read the counter and then increment it by one. SSI isn't going to work well because then every single one of the transactions is going to eventually have to be aborted and restarted because there are so many conflicts. In that case, we would want to be using two-phase locking. So if we're thinking, okay, well, you know, most of the transactions are probably going to be creating race conditions or concurrency bugs with each other, we should stick to a pessimistic concurrency control method such as two-phase locking. But in the majority of cases, actually, a lot of writes are disjoint and don't really affect one another. If I'm going on Facebook and I'm posting to my profile and you're posting to your profile, our writes probably aren't impacting each other. You know, that being said, if two computers at the same time are logged into my profile and writing, that could be a problem. But that's exactly what optimistic concurrency control is able to handle. In that minority case, it's actually able to go ahead and fix those race conditions. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will be seeing you in the next one. Definitely had to avoid making a lot of abortion jokes throughout this, but uh, I did my best and have a good one, guys.